Oi. Welcome back to Real Vision. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be playing uh, Connect Four for this episode of Skin in the Game. Have you ever played Connect Four before? I have, with my kids. Good, that's, that's uh, where I've been playing it, and I'm, I'm not particularly good, so uh, it sounds like we're probably on a level footing. Uh, it's Britain versus Spain, Britain versus Europe. I wonder how that's going to end up. Uh, probably not very well for Britain. But uh, let's kick off, we'll, we'll get these out. And which, uh, which color would you like to be? Which um, colors got, do we have here? It's gold and the silver. Oh, I'm going to go for gold, that's a good one. Go for gold, and theoretically, if you start, you should win. So I'll let you start. Would you like to kick it off? There you go. There. Excellent. And normally, you're supposed to go in the middle. Okay. If we think of uh, next year, I think that the the key factors that we need to think about are what is going to be l the the outlook on three levels: monetary, macro and earnings. Um, in general, considering where expectations are right now, we are still in a downgrade mode, both on the macro factors, so we are still seeing, for example, industrial production, ISMs slowly uh, uh, descending from the high levels at which they were. Global debt is also an important factor. Uh, the second one, monetary factors, uh, are very important because if you look at the, the way in which most investors are positioned right now, the vast majority are expecting that the improvement for next year is going to come from central banks not doing what they have said that they will do, which in general is a, is, is a, is a pretty dangerous position to be in. However, um, even if they did, and I believe that they will definitely slow down the pace of normalization, uh, we need to understand that the pace of normalization continued to be an extraordinarily uh, bullish environment in terms of monetary policy. It was extremely dovish. Uh, interest rates remain depressed. Liquidity was still very high. Money supply growth, even with the Federal Reserve taking reducing its balance sheet, has been growing above real GDP. Therefore, the risk that I see from the investor standpoint is that central bank policy has become part of the liquidity. So we have seen in Japan, we have seen in uh, Europe, that despite ongoing easing, it does not transfer into multiple expansion and uh, financial asset uh, growth uh, or uh, valuations uh, growing. It only helps uh, yields remain low. It only helps valuations remain where they are. It just it basically works sort of as a cushion, but not as a as a sort of inflating uh, bubble type of uh, type of scenario. Uh, so that's on monetary policy, and then on earnings. Then on earnings, when you look at markets today. Many people say, look, uh, markets have become very cheap very quickly. Uh, we have almost two points of a PE that have been taken out of the market. Therefore, you can bet on good growth next year in order to uh, cement the view that markets are going to rise. Now, the problem that I see is earnings estimates. The problem that I see continues to be in earnings estimates because I continue to believe that uh, earnings estimates have not come down enough for next year. For example, you still see in financials expectations of double-digit EPS growth. That is very, very, very unlikely. Same in industrials, same in consumers, same in energy, which has been one of the, let's say, most hyped sectors. So I would be cautious from that perspective as well. What we need to understand is that in an environment in which central banks continue to be accommodative, but macro data is not supportive, earnings data is not supportive, is that cycles become very, very short. So we need to be a lot more active. We need to think of uh, equities, bonds, etc. Instead of an ongoing trend up, you know, we need to think of them as, well, we are in a, in a process of disinflation. So we will see abrupt changes mm -hmm in what is most likely to be a correction phase. And that's what we need to take, uh, in my opinion, as, as the sort of 
general idea for next year. I think that um, the Chinese slowdown, the Eurozone slowdown, very important, both of them happening with ongoing expansion of monetary policy on go with very aggressive policies from governments with deficit spending at uh, continuing to drive, to drive the, the government's policies. Therefore, uh, we cannot say that the situation that we're seeing this year is due to trade wars or due to the normalization of the Federal Reserve. We need to, it's, it's sort of a subterfuge that we use to, to, to avoid the reality. And the reality is debt saturation. Is this a world where asset prices are kind of leading? So economies are okay, and it's not the economy that's gonna see asset prices fall, but do we need to worry about asset prices, and therefore will central banks react to more declines in asset prices if they happen next year, and with more liquidity? Central banks care a lot about asset prices. The Central Bank of Japan would not be buying equities if they didn't care about asset prices. Buying equities has absolutely nothing to do with inflation or with unemployment or with GDP growth. It's because they care about asset prices, and they do. Uh, so I think that the difference in the United States is that the Federal Reserve finds itself in a position in which if they care only about asset prices, they don't build enough tools into a change of cycle. And therefore, they might end up creating a larger problem than the solution that they know they will not achieve because they also should understand that reverting the path uh, is not going to make people go massively bullish and it's not going to make asset prices rise even further. So, uh, and more importantly, if they revert the policy, they will give a message to markets that they know something that we don't know and that that something is truly bad. So, so on, that, on that side, they should pay more. I think that being data dependent, as Jerome Powell has mentioned so many times, is something that they definitely uh, should continue to be. Uh, and, and the so that is on the Federal Reserve side. On the on the the situation with the Central Bank of Japan and the ECB is completely different. Both of them are trapped. Both of them are trapped because on one side the ECB perfect knows completely that there is no real demand for uh, sovereign bonds at these yields, not even close. We would need to think of double the levels of uh, sovereign bond yields that we're seeing right now for investors to think of uh, purchasing uh, Eurozone uh, bonds, uh, sovereign bonds, uh, if the central bank was not purchasing. Therefore, I think that uh, that, is a, that is a big challenge because on one side, the Eurozone countries have saved themselves about 1 trillion euros in interest expenses, not bad, but they've spent it all. And the very few countries in the Eurozone are ready for uh, an increase of, not doubling, an increase of 10, 20% of, uh, of their uh, borrowing costs. So I think that that is one, one problem. The, therefore, it is extremely likely that the ECB will find uh, imaginative ways of calling, uh, maintaining the policy. So TLTROs, uh, you know, different liquidity injections, uh, repurchases of maturities, they will continue to do that, pretty much like Japan. Pretty much like Japan, so therefore an, an, an almost perennial uh, easing policy. The, the, the problem is that it becomes part of the liquidity. And the problem is that right now in the Eurozone, in Japan, uh, also in China, uh, those massive injections of liquidity are only helping contain a bit the risk, but they're not helping expand multiples, get people to be to take more risk, uh, companies to invest more. Companies are not going to invest more because interest rates remain low when uh, overcapacity, debt saturation, and uh, general business conditions globally are weakening. Sounds like the outlook for next year is that growth starts to contract. Italy doesn't look particularly uh, robust and the banks are carrying quite a lot of that debt. 
So what's your view on, let's say, within regions, what's your view on, on Europe, on Italy, on the European banks? Because mm. um, the SX7E, we all watch it, but it never seems to take off. In fact, mm. it just goes sideways or down. European banks have done a, an admirable job at improving their balance sheet and their capital ratios in a, in a very negative environment, very low interest rates, uh, no inflation, you name it. So you cannot strengthen the balance sheet and at the same time see multiple expansion or improvement in the in, in equities when there is no real undeni underlying earnings growth. And obviously, uh, profitability is very, very poor. So uh, re return on tangible equity is atrocious. All the, all the challenges that we know of, of, uh, of European banks. So European banks have on one side almost 900 billion of non-performing loans. That is a massive burden on them, no matter how the economy uh, moves. Second, they have at the same time more than 100 billion of uh, cocos, of these uh, debt hybrids that helped strengthen their core capital ratios, but they're uh, almost a, a weapon of mass destruction because they become a domino effect, a domino negative effect on, equi on the equity when uh, the domino uh, start, uh, starts to move to the risk side. No? Mm -hmm. uh, so the contagion effect remains but it is true also that they are much stronger than what they were uh, six, seven years ago. And I think that uh, the, the, the outlook for the, the Eurozone banks is very challenging because the European Central Bank will continue to keep very, very low rates and will continue to have a policy that, uh, that continues to drive zombification of the economy. Um, so on one side, it's almost like a running to stand still strategy. You have, uh, you have governments and the European Central Bank pushing for higher credit growth, and that credit growth is riskier with lower returns. So in general, what I think is that uh, the Eurozone is unable to disguise through monetary policy its structural problems. And its structural problems are aging of the population, overcapacity, lack of productivity growth, and at the same time, uh, an extraordinary high level, especially compared to the US, the UK, Japan, of unemployment. Those factors uh, are all added to a very high level of government spending. The Eurozone has sort of, I would say, convinced itself that the entire problem was the alleged austerity. There's no austerity. It's 40% uh, public spending to GDP. So the solution that they are looking at is further and higher government spending. And government spending is not going to drive, uh, let's say, productivity growth, improvement in the economy, and uh, the, the changes that the Eurozone desperately needs. So it's very likely that, it, that the Eurozone continues to do what Japan did in the late 80s. And this is what they are doing right now, and therefore the outcome is likely to be very similar. It sounds like this, the, the, what they're going to be doing is, is easing themselves through a slowdown in growth. The, the banks are in a slightly better position, but it sounds like you probably don't want to touch them next year. Hmm. Um, and therefore, do you think that um, we're going to continue to see divergence between the European Central Bank and the US, which yes. was one of the key drivers, particularly at the beginning of 2018. Hmm. Do you see divergence in 2019? Yes, because the US economy, with all of its challenges, is much more robust than the European economy. And because the US economy does not need massive injections of uh, liquidity in order to maintain cheap deficit spending. The U.S. Uh, economy uh, is, uh, has a very strong deficit spending uh, policy from the, uh, from, the, from the government. However, it does not require the Federal Reserve to buy those bonds. You have bond deals at 2.98 with, uh, with the highest deficit uh, in, a few, in a few years, no? Uh, in, and in the case of the Eurozone, it is not the case. In the case of the Eurozone, it definitely needs the support of the European Central Bank, because again, there is no secondary demand. We have to think about this. In 
Uh, throughout the, the, the years of, Q, of, of QE in the United States, the Federal Reserve was never 100% of the demand for sovereign bonds uh, in the market. So it always kept an eye on the secondary market, even though it was influencing aggressively the yields of sovereign bonds, it is also true that there was always a secondary market moving around. That is not the case in the Eurozone. In the Eurozone, um, the European Central Bank is 100% of the, of the demand for sovereign bonds for the majority of the, of the net financing needs of the Eurozone countries. As such, there is absolutely no way of understanding where will investors want to, in, to buy Portuguese Spanish, Italian bonds. And you were mentioning Italy. Um, the, the, the situation with Italy is something that we have seen before. We tend to forget because the, the, the markets tend to be amnesiac, no? But this has happened before. This happened with Berlusconi. You remember all the, all the criticism about the, the lack of budget control and uh, lack of uh, uh, adherence to the demands of uh, France and Germany, all these things. We have seen them before. Now, the problem is, what will be the solution? The solution will likely be a negotiated one in which Italy will be allowed to, yet again, go into higher deficits hmm, in exchange for tweaking a little bit the budget. But that is not the problem. The problem is that the, 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 the economic situation of, uh, of Italy, of Spain, of Portugal, of France is not going to be solved by uh, increasing government spending. The, it is actually the problem because there's a crowding out effect happening all the time in the private sector. It deters from credit growth, it deters from investment because what it, with higher government spending comes Afterwards, higher taxation, more intervention, more administrative uh, uh, burdens, all those things. And, and that is the problem. The problem is that governments are not a source of, uh, let's say, allowing growth to strengthen. They are almost uh, eating away out of, out of the, the, the private sector and growth drivers by perpetuating uh, the imbalances. There's been austerity in the private sector, that is true in Europe, but there hasn't been austerity in the, in the public sector. And um, uh, most of the improvement in deficit spending of the Eurozone countries has come from much lower bond yields. Uh, and that has been purely monetary policy driven. Therefore, we need to be, uh, I think, quite cautious because if we're seeing the data of uh, Germany, industrial production, very weak, uh, consumer confidence, business confidence, uh, the exports, all those factors from the economy that is strongest in terms of uh, fiscal and trade imbalances, imagine the domino effect into the southern European countries, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And that is not going to be stopped by saying, oh, instead of purchasing uh, 15 billion uh, bonds uh, per month, we're going to, to purchase 30. And do you think there's going to be enough global growth to actually prevent a crisis appearing next year? Because I think if there is a global, a proper global slowdown and recession, it's going to be very difficult for Europe. But do you think next year, 2019, will have sufficient growth to prevent a real crisis and therefore Europe will be able to fudge its way through again? Hmm. I think that the, the signals of uh, recession are very, very vague yet. That doesn't mean that, that they, it, it might not accelerate because the, the, the incremental weakness of data is quite alarming, I have to say. If you look at uh, how uh, what, we, what was a sort of a moderate slowdown from January to August has accelerated quite, quite a lot in the, last, in the last month. So my concern is that uh, in the way in which governments and uh, central banks are positioned right now, there are no tools to address a much deeper slowdown. If there is a, a true global slowdown led by China and emerging markets, the Eurozone is not, is not able to uh, sort of uh, navigate its way out of it. It will, it will be the same way that it was very levered to the 
mirage recovery of emerging markets and, and, and the economy, it is also very levered to the downside. Domestic Europe looks like it will struggle either like banks because of the issues you've raised. Um, people have always looked to the kind of export side of Europe. And if we look at things like the DAX, which has got this relationship with, with um, total social financing, the financing out of China, Q1 is always quite an important time for China in terms of its financing. Do you think China is going to come to the rescue with sufficient liquidity or any liquidity? Or do you think China is caught in a liquidity trap as well? China is already caught in a liquidity trap. China has been posting weakening numbers quarter on quarter for more than two years. I think that the... So what China... The, China made a mistake, in my opinion, the government, uh, I would say, yes, 18 months ago, two years ago, when uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy of addressing in the increasing debt and the, 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 the so-called change of model from, a, from an industrially intensive to a consumer-driven uh, model was stopped. Uh, I think that that was a big mistake. And I think that that was a big mistake because at the, by trying to maintain a level of growth that was clearly unnecessary and absolutely over-optimistic, on the other side, it has increased dramatically its imbalances. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, for, that China does not have the tools to, uh, to, to, let's say, change the course of what already started two years ago. Because they are already in a massive expansion mode. They are already in a massive stimulus mode. I mean, this is an economy that is allegedly growing at 6.5%, that has allegedly 3% uh, inflation, and where the government is injecting around $100 billion dollars into uh, the banks almost every quarter, and that is uh, devaluing the currency, and that is m implementing massive uh, stimulus uh, policies all over the country. That doesn't compute one with the other, does it? You don't have an economy that is growing 6.5% healthily with low inflation and at the same time um, devalue your currency stealthily, obviously, and, uh, and impose a massive stimulus. So I think that that is... Uh, the, the, we're missing something there. And I think that as we move into 2019... It is very difficult that the solution for the Eurozone, for Germany, for the exporting countries comes from China because China is already in stimulus mode. It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, they're, they're sort of uh, hawkish. But no, they're, you know, they're, uh, the interest rates are, are very low. They're reducing capital requirements. They're reducing the levels of, of risk uh, that uh, got, uh, banks need to monitor in order to uh, drive credit growth. It's a stimulus plan in, in, in everything, probably except in name or in announcement. Um, so I, I would be extremely cautious about that. I think that the Eurozone's, uh, let's say, bullish view was that exports had driven the recovery and the recovery would cement uh, itself and, and strengthen through internal demand. That second part is not happening. Next year, do you think, and, and we're obviously filming this in sort of early, mid-December, so assuming between now and the end of the year, nothing's happened. Do you think 2019 is the year that the NIMBY goes through seven, so Iwan actually is allowed to go through? And do you think that's going to be a major, um, mm -hmm. major element of next year's uh, risk environment? Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese government is not aware or doesn't seem to want to be aware of the fact that the Yuan devaluation is hurting its economy much more than what it intends to sort of address or solve, much more. So yes, uh, the, the trade surplus with the United States is growing, but the, the level of internal demand, the uh, level of non-performing loans, the level of risk, uh, uh, all of those uh, elements that were driven actually by a strengthening of the purchasing power of the Chinese citizens, all of that is is worsening and very, very rapidly. Uh, 
And the temptation of governments to solve their imbal imbalances via devaluation is not a novelty. It's, nothing, <laughs> it's not something that we have just invented. It's something that they will always try to do. So if I had to say what is the risk versus the, of, of the UN going through seven versus going back to 6.2, 6.5, 6, 6 I would say that it's clearly skewed to uh, a further devaluation down the line. Oh my gosh, look at you. You've yes. played this before. Well, I'm sort of hoping and relying on, on your hopefully lack of ability. Oh, yeah, especially if I start so, using well, the ones that I... Feel free to, feel free to on that front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've got to now block here, block yeah. and tackle. Next year looks like it's a, a 2019 probably tricky environment for broad-based equities. So let's move on to broad-based bonds, which is mainly US bonds. Um, the last year was the big debate. Um, will yields break higher, break out the 30-year tre trend channel and hit 4%? Um, or will we see a slowdown and therefore yields drop? Where would you be on, let's say, broad-based bonds, forgetting Europe, just the broad US 10-year, US yeah. 30? The the investment world and the financial world is a game of relatives. So imagine that you, the, this is the situation. You have all of the governments in the world huh, defending their financing needs. And all of the corporates in the world, when you listen to third quarter results, conference calls, when you or to second quarter results, they're all the time talking about credit. They're not talking about, they're talking about our balance sheet is stronger, our cash flow generation is stronger, blah, 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 blah. So everybody's saying to us, bonds are fine. I don't care about the rest. And the, more importantly, next year, almost 185 countries are going to be deficit spending. That deficit spending is going to be financed. Now, if you look at consensus estimates of those deficits, uh, they're actually quite modest uh, deficits because everybody's assuming that deficits will be lower in 2019 than in 2018. Very unlikely because global growth is slower and because the net financing needs of those governments will actually increase because tax revenues will not be as robust as expected. Therefore, you have wider net financing needs from governments that will finance their deficits. And at the same time, liquidity and uh, injections have become part, part of what we all expect. Not, not that they will be lower, central banks will continue to ease, to be in easing mode, but the, the amount of liquidity will be much lower than the net financing needs. As such, what you have is liquidity is not going up dramatically, but net financing needs go up. Therefore, that something gives. Hmm? And as such, the so-called run from bonds to equities never happens. Uh, but more importantly, I think that what bonds are telling us right now is that this mirage of the reflation trade that we've been hearing over and over and over again doesn't exist. That this monster money creation that we have seen in the last years, what it does is perpetuate imbalances, perpetuate overcapacity, incentivize higher debt, and with that, disinflationary pressures. The situation in China, China uh, slows down, devalues the currency in order to try to, to, to sort of try to uh, solve its imbalances through devaluation and exports disinflation to the rest of the world. The United States slows down from the growth of 2018, deficit spending continues, it detracts liquidity from the rest of the world. What do you buy? German bonds and US 10 years. There's no, because, because the risk is not reflation, but disinflation. Meanwhile, the rest of emerging markets, re emerging markets, sorry, the, uh, the main emerging markets are going to hold on to their reserves of foreign exchange uh, as much as they can, as they should, and as they have very well done. What does that mean? They will not let, they will not defend their currencies. So that is disinflationary as well. So I think that that, um, 
the risk of disinflation is something that that is what, in my opinion, bond yields are telling us right now. Core bonds are probably a buy in 2019. The other area which has probably been everybody's favorite trade for the last decade has been long various forms of credit. And if you look at, I think, investment grade in the US, total return on things like the LQD, I think it's going to be, by the end of 2018, down 4 or 5% in total returns. And you've talked about um, there's three times the amount of triple B in Europe that there is high yield. There's 2.4 times in the US that there is high yield. So there's this sort of little time bomb there. What's your view for 2019 on sort of the core credit markets? Yeah, the, the biggest risk in credit markets is in the, in the extremes. No? The biggest risk in, in credit markets are, is in sovereign bonds and in uh, high yield. No? Now, central banks are going to defend sovereign bonds. Don't, don't even doubt about it. They're not going to defend high yield. Now, more importantly, they cannot. So spreads continue to widen, continue to widen. They creep up, they creep up, they creep up. More, and, and they creep up as solvency and liquidity ratios weaken. Therefore, the so-called high yield that I call high yield with no yield, because obviously at 35-year low yields, that is, you're, you're basically uh, getting bonds at 4% of, of companies that are, that are virtually bankrupt, or 5% in some cases. So that is where the, let's say, the symptom is likely to, 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 to be uh, more abrupt, because uh, central banks will be paying all of their attention to, uh, to sovereign bond uh, yields and keeping them as low as they can. Not that they can do a lot, as we have seen in the Eurozone, about uh, them uh, spreads rising, but at least not rising as much as they, as they fear. And therefore, it is in the high yield side. So the ones that strengthen in that environment, and if you remember the, the Eurozone crisis in 2011, that actually happened as well, is that the investment grade, the boring companies, these, these companies in, in Europe that have uh, better solvency and liquidity ratios than sovereigns, and, that, uh, and the, the, those actually do extremely well. Those actually perform very, very well, while the, let's say that the, the highest risk side is where you start to see the cracks because it's almost like going back to to the games that I played with my children it's almost that like that game that my children had when they were small in which you you push something and something just goes like whack-a-mole exactly yeah. exactly and see and something just goes like this and this is what what is likely to happen is that Credit spreads in a high yield continue to go up. Also, as banks need to withdraw liquidity and credit growth and refinancing of zombie debt over and over again. No? It's a chess mentality I see you've got here. I like the speed style. This one's actually turning into quite a good, tense game. Oh, I see what you're doing there. We just change tack slightly, um, sort of the apex predator as it is, or was, or could be, um, the dollar. Yeah. Uh, get the dollar right and you probably get your portfolio right in 2019. <laughs> it sounds like with the divergence, you'd probably be on the side of a stronger dollar in 2019. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can uh, overtake the previous peak and make a new high on the dollar index? Let's, let's start from what has driven the, the dollar this year. No? The dollar index is in the same trend that it's been for five years. It's done nothing. If you look at it on a five-year basis, it's done absolutely nothing. Just a little bit goes a little bit higher, goes a little bit lower, but it's in the same channel. So I'm not, I'm not worried about the dollar. I don't think that it's strength of the dollar. I think it's weakening of the rest of the currencies, and more importantly, de uh, stealth devaluation of the yuan. So the bet that we need to, that we need to think all the time Stop thinking about Jerome Powell. Stop thinking about the Fed. Think about Xi Jinping. Think about what, what is happening in China and whether they need further devaluations of the Yuan to sort of address some of their challenges, and, or they think that they do. That is the key. The other, part, the other part is obviously commodities. Commodities are already telling us that it's going to be very difficult for emerging market currencies to defend their uh, uh, this for their central banks to defend their currencies because dollar revenues are not coming in. So you have more an environment, not of 
of relative strength of the dollar because of weakening of other currencies. And next year and the, and the year after, 2019 and 2020, is when that massive wall of maturities of emerging market debt in US dollars starts to kick in. And this is, so those governments are going to pay their debts. They're going to pay those, those bonds in U.S. dollars. Uh, are they going to pay those bonds in U.S. dollars uh, by defending their currency? No, they need to keep their, their FX reserves. Therefore, my, my view is uh, that uh, we might see some uh, ups and downs, but the trend of the dollar index Relative, or so the, the dollar relative to its main trading currencies is likely to creep up higher, in my opinion. And within the emerging markets, would you stay short, or maybe not stay short, but would you look to be um, adding shorts on those countries that were sick dogs through 2018? So those are sort of the famous five, as it were, places like the Turkeys of the world, where you saw that currency weakness. Hmm. Do you think that those would be still the first choices, or do you think there's going to be others that come in, other contenders that come in, to be a good shorts for 2019 mm -hmm. on the currency front, yeah. and maybe also on the equity front if, if we see that. Yeah. I was recently in Argentina, and I remember that uh, a friend of mine was saying, uh, well, what's the news? This has been ongoing for 70 years. So for some reason, the market has seen what happened in 2018 as an uh, anomaly. But the Turkish lira, the Argentine peso, many of these currencies have been, have been weakening for many, many years. That's why I was mentioning before the, the five-year dollar index trend, no? The Indian rupee. Are they, uh, uh, the Indian rupee might strengthen because commodities are falling, but the, in general, the trend for most of these currencies is, this is the way we need to think about this. Are the governments going to stop financing uh, government spending, excess government spending with printing money. No. Cool. Then you have to be extremely cautious. Every bump, uh, and you will see, obviously, I mean, it will be, we will see ups and downs, but every bump is going to drive the next leg down. The next leg down, by the way, that did not start in 2018, that started, that started before. So what are you going to put in your portfolio? Are you going to be long cash? Or is there anything that you actually think you want to be long? I would not be, I would not look at, you see, we mentioned before that cycles are becoming shorter and more abrupt. Hmm? So we need to take advantage of those short cycles by being a lot more active. Will we see next year 20% up moves in equities at some point? Absolutely we will. Absolutely we will. The excess uh, movements down will lead to uh, excess movement ups. The, the trick is to think that that is a change of trend. That, so in my opinion, the, the long-term trend that we're building is a disinflationary, multiple compressing environment for equities. And, uh, uh, and in an environment in which central banks and governments will continue to defend uh, their, their sovereign bonds. That is sort of the way that I, that I look at it. And the more that they do that, the more that the disinflationary pressures build because you perpetuate overcapacity, you perpetuate debt, and the thing just, you know, just keeps zombifying itself. However, what does, what does that mean? Bumps, big bumps from time to time. So likely to see... Uh, the same way that we saw last year, uh, this year, sorry, in 2018 and in 2017, some big moves up mm, uh, on, on the everything is discounted. This is, this is going to be the, the, the beginning of the year broker uh, message all over the world. It's going to be everything is discounted. Our clients are very bearish. Everything is, uh, and things are not that bad. And, it's, and it will be true, and it will be true, but it will not last a lot. Be so what I would do is to be a lot more active. I think that we need to pay, uh, to, we need to forget about indices. We need to forget about sort of big 
uh, uh, ETF driven ideas and think more about companies. There are companies that, are, that, in, that with weakening commodities and weakening currencies are going to make a killing. Hmm? There are going to be, so that, that is the way that I, that I think about it. Be a lot more active. The, the, the last 10 years have been driving investors towards passive and you sort of let yourself be driven by central banks. That, that, that is gone, even if they continue. Don't fall, uh, don't fall under that tra- under, into that trap. Then take the opportunity of those big bumps. Um, and what I would say is that that will help uh, shape uh, a view in which if you are not extremely exposed to anything that is reflationary, the the big changes will not affect you uh, dramatically. You might, when there's a big move up, n- not make a lot of money, but you're not going to lose a lot afterwards. I would, I would, I don't think we're, that I should uh, stress enough how aggressive the disinflationary pressures are and how little tools governments have. Those that are betting on helicopter money, on uh, a new QE, all those things, fail to see that those things are happening as we speak. As we speak, the Central Bank of England, the Central Bank of Switzerland, Central Bank of Japan, Central Bank of Europe, all of them are on easing mode. Interest rates are extremely low and and we still have negative real interest rates. So, uh, the, so I would say be very tactical, <clears throat> very data-driven, and very much about individual companies and individual countries' uh, solvency and liquidity, liquidity ratios and fundamentals in order, to, in order to invest. Probably an unfair question given what you just said about trading the year, but 2019, one absolute dog of an asset that you would sell and one that you'd absolutely like to own for the year? I think that next year, uh, U.S. equities will do better than what most uh, most of consensus are expecting i would be in the it's a, everybody's telling me that that uh, uh, consumer goods are are very expensive i like consumer goods i like defense i like defense stocks uh, i like investment grade uh, bonds i think that investment grade bonds uh, large boring multinationals are showing a much better risk reward. Something that I would not like to own next year, mm-hmm. the Nikkei. I would be, I'm, it, it scares me like there's no tomorrow because everybody that's bullish on Japan is bullish based on the mirage of growth. Obviously, that never happens. I think that we can establish that that is quite a big challenge. And it's the economy and the market that is most exposed to a slowdown in the Asian theme. And just one final bonus question. Does that mean that the yen is one of the few currencies that strengthens versus the dollar? I think so. So towards 100? I don't know, but but uh, if if, uh, if the if the picture if the global picture that I'm painting is correct, uh, the yen strengthens because the it's it's a it's a currency that benefits from a tremendous amount of savings from its citizens and its companies uh, from outside. So it, it's, uh, therefore, on a relative basis. Despite the challenges of the Japanese economy, which will continue to to be the same ones as they have been in the last 20 years, and despite the challenges of uh, of the global economy, the yen tends to become a safe haven. This one's a, a good a good game, very good game. No. Oh, you have, yes. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) Daniel, thank (laughs) Thank you. you As ever, thank you very much for your your worldviews, your global views, and for playing the game. I can't believe I lost, but anyway. No, no, no. It it, it it was was due. It was due, definitely. It is uh, a lot more difficult than than one thinks. Absolutely. With the cameras on, the pressure. (laughs) That's the reason, (laughs) isn't it? There's no pressure. (laughs) It's the inability inability to get a simple. We'll do lots and crosses next time. Absolutely. Uh, Good Um, to have you on once more. Thank you very much indeed. We'll need to play a lot more. Absolutely. Well, yeah, get your kids, get yourself. I get the, the my kids. My kids are the good ones. Yeah. We should have brought I'll, them. I'll, I'll tell them. What they to get and they the probably know more about.
about the dollar than I do. So that's <laughs> <Okay. laughs> great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Absolutely.